The story of Job is one that I choose to believe it is a very well-known story. People know that Job lost everything. They know that he lost his family. They know that he lost his wealth. They even know that he lost his health a bit there as well. The patience of Job, that is also something that is very well known, though, as you often hear me suggest when I speak about Job and his patience, his patience is typically misconstrued as being the quiet type of patience that was tolerant of everything that had happened to him without grumbling and without complaint. I'll tell you that that was not the case if you actually read and you study the book of Job. Job, he he endured, but I will tell you that he did not do so quietly. Job and his three friends, they argued. And they're arguing, I tell you, that it was not pretty. (laughs) Now, standing by listening to the discourse of Job and his three friends was a young man who was named Elihu. Elihu, I would suggest to you today, he is representative of many believers today who stand by and watch two sides go at it in a battle of self-righteousness. That is a battle of who knows what is right and who knows what is best for you. Now, as Elihu stood by watching the two parties argue, Scripture tells us there in the 32nd chapter of Job and in the second verse, Mm -hmm. Scripture tells us that Elihu grew a bit frustrated with Job and and with the three friends. Mm -hmm. So Elihu, he decided that he was going to take a stand. Elihu, he, he was frustrated with Job because Job, while arguing with his three friends, became very self righteous and He justified himself, we are told there in that second verse, rather than the Lord. Elihu, we're told there in the third verse of that 32nd chapter of Job, Elihu was frustrated with the three friends because in their piety and in their self-righteousness, they condemned Job rather than give him the help that he sought and that he needed. Now imagine that for a moment, Mm -hmm. condemning those that are in need of help. Sounds familiar? Now, as I prepared this week's sermon, I thought about our society today. Mm -hmm. I thought about recent rulings and recent decisions and judgments that have been made in recent weeks. There have been decisions made that have frightened and have upset many people Mm -hmm. while a select group believing that they know what is right and what is best for everyone Mm -hmm. choose to cheer and to celebrate with thunderous applause. The ego, the pride, the piety, Mm -hmm. the self-righteousness of it all It is something that annoys me. It is something that frustrates me greatly. Mm -hmm. I'm not a fan of Mm self-righteousness. I remember a lesson that my dad taught me when I was younger. When he told me, you never know whose help that you will need. Don't ever look down on anyone. Mm -hmm. I often wonder why we just can't choose to live in peace with one another. I often wonder why we can't mind our own business, but at the same time, find a means to be able to help uplift one another rather than tear each other down. I don't know if you hear me here today. Why is it that we work so hard to bring harm to one another rather than make peace with each other? I tell you again, it is all about ego. Mm -hmm. It is all about pride. It is all about piety and self-righteousness. 
And these things, they have been the demise of so many in our society and in our world today. It was the self-righteousness of one group that led to the enslavement of another. It was the self-righteousness of one group believing that they knew what was best that led to another group being told where they could not eat, where they could not drink water from a water fountain, or where they could not use the bathroom. Here we are today. The self-righteousness of a few Mm -hmm. dictate to others what they can and cannot do with their own body. Mm -hmm. And yet this weekend, we ironically celebrate freedom, liberty, Mm -hmm. and independence. Seems like I would tell you a stand must be made Mm -hmm. against self-righteousness. And I believe that we must do so in the right way. Now, ego and pride, self-righteousness, those are not words that we typically associate with Job. After all, we're told in scripture that Job was a blameless and upright man that feared the Lord. And those words were said by the Lord himself. Job, he, 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 I believe, stood as a, a pillar of what a good and faithful man or a good and faithful person was supposed to be. And he stood as that pillar in his community. See, I believe that Job being a representation of what a good and faithful person was supposed to be. I believe that that was the main reason as to why Elihu was so frustrated with Job in the first place. You see, Elihu, he watched as a good and faithful man was brought down in his spirit by his so-called friends. Rather than speaking uplifting words to Job, they adamantly blamed Job for his suffering. As James said in his letter, Mm -hmm. said that the tongue is both powerful and very dangerous in that it can set fire to the course of nature. Job's friends in their piety and in their Mm self-righteousness thought that they were better than him. And by their tongue, in their piety, and in their self-righteousness, they set fire to Job. Mm -hmm. And they managed to bring out the worst in him. The actions of the self-righteous, they have a habit of doing this, don't they? Mm -hmm. Job, he, he felt moved to take a stand and defend himself, which I believe many of us can understand. He he felt that he needed to defend his integrity. He felt that he needed to defend his righteousness. But I would tell you that he took a stand from the wrong place. He took a stand from a place of fiery anger and bitterness. You see, one has to be careful in how they choose to take a stand. You see, I believe that there is a right way to take a stand and a wrong way to go about taking the stand for oneself. For the child of God, we cannot take a stand from a place of wrath. We cannot take a stand from a place of bitterness because again, as James said in his letter, wrath and bitterness does not produce the righteousness of God. I want you to hear that once again. Again, wrath and bitterness does not produce the righteousness of God that should be coming from the child of God. In his bitterness, in his self-righteousness, Job, he told his friends that he was not inferior to them. That he had as much understanding as they did. Now, some of us will go, well, hey, ain't nothing wrong with that. I tell people that I ain't dumb. I tell them that all the time. You, you, I'm not inferior to, to you. I have just as much knowledge and, and as much as understanding as you do. So nothing sounds terrible about that response. But I want you to notice that his response was a response to meet them on their level. 
their level of piety, their level of self-righteousness. I want you to understand here today is that Job went down the slippery slope of piety and self-righteousness. And in going down that slope, he fell into the pool of self-righteousness alongside them. The man of faith had become self-righteous. Job, he began to complain in his self-righteousness. And in his self-righteousness, he turned his, his, his anger or his bitterness away from his friends. And he began to make accusations against the Lord. In the seventh chapter of Job and in the 10th chapter of Job, Job, he, he justified himself of the accusations and, and the complaints that he was making. Job, he accused the Lord of being against him and striking him with poisonous arrows. Mm -hmm. Job, he, he, he was so far down this slope that he accused the Lord in the 27th chapter of taking away his justice. And he said that it was God who was making him bitter in his soul. All right. yeah. So after hearing this, I believe that all of us could understand Elihu's frustration. Job's friends, they did nothing to help him. And Job, he was speaking wildly out of grief and out of sorrow and out of despair. And all his friends was doing was adding on to it, bringing him further and further down in his soul. The self-righteous person, they cannot truly help another unless there's something in it for them. All right. All right. Then when, when they're dictating and, and trying to push their way on to someone else, we find that the self-righteous always manage to bring out the worst in others. Yeah, yeah. When two come together and start to act out of self-righteousness against the other, they can never come together in understanding. Two parties that are self-righteous they can never come to an understanding. Do you hear me here today? All right. All right. Now, someone may say, why is that the case? Mm -hmm. I'll tell you that that is the case because their righteousness won't allow them to be humble. Their righteousness won't allow them to concede. Mm -hmm. Their righteousness won't allow them to work together. The end result is Two stuck in the mud, fighting with no end in sight out of their self-righteousness. Here's where we are today in our society. Stuck in the mud, fighting against each other in a battle of self-righteousness with no end in sight about who is right mm -hmm. and who knows what is best for not just themselves, but for someone else. Well, mm -hmm. Having an effect on all of us who are caught up in the middle of this fight. Well. That is the stance of the self-righteous. Right. A stance that has led to the suffering of many especially those who are stuck, caught in the middle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At some point, frustration boils over and a stand will be taken by those that are stuck in the middle. Oh, yeah. 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 It is of the utmost importance that we as genuine believers, when we take a stand, that we take a stand that ensures that we are doing so out of true righteousness and not out of a self-absorbed self-righteousness. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. The believer, when they take a stand, the believer should take a stand that is of true righteousness. Mm -hmm. And when I say true righteousness, I am talking about God. Yeah. You see, we can only become righteous through the Lord yeah. because God is righteous. Mm -hmm. 
And there is none other that is righteous but him. I hope you heard that today. Now, Elihu is the example that we're going to be taking a look at today. He is the example that we're going to look at following here in our sermon today. Now, in the 32nd chapter of Job, we see that when Elihu finally spoke up, we'll see that he approached Job and his friends from a place of humility from a place of respect that already separates him from Job and, and his friends specifically, especially those friends. Elihu again, he was a young man who out of humility and respect, we're told in the seventh and in the eighth verse there in the 32nd chapter of Job, Elihu said that he waited for Job and that, that he waited for his friends. He waited for them to finish before he even said a word, before he spoke. Mm -hmm. So again, right away, I would suggest to you that this young man, he was not letting himself be guided by his own self-righteousness. Mm -hmm. He was letting himself, he was letting his words be guided by the Lord. All right. That is what I would tell you right away, what we pick up here from Elihu. In, in the 12th Psalm, David said that the words of the Lord, they are pure, that they are like silver, tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. In other words, the words of the Lord are perfect. They are without fail. Those who live by the words of the Lord are living by words that lead to holiness. They're living by words that lead to true righteousness. Whereas those who abide by any other words are abiding by words that are imperfect. They are abiding by words that are full of failure. And so those that are self-righteous and those that are living by these imperfect words, this is why they cannot be of true assistance to anyone. They, they by abiding by their own words, can't even be of help to themselves. I tell you, this is why Job's friends could not uplift him. And at the very same time, I will tell you that this is why Job, he could not find an understanding himself. Job sought for understanding, but in his self-righteousness, he could not find understanding. You see, they were living by another word at that point in time. They believed themselves to be perfect according to their own words, when in actuality, they were just as imperfect as anybody else. You see, this is the danger of self-righteousness. Believing yourself to be perfect when in truth you are not perfect. None of us are perfect. That is an understanding that everybody has to come to. Nobody is perfect. If you believe you are perfect, you are lost. You are terribly lost in your self-righteousness. To think or to believe such shows how little the self-righteous thinks of the Lord. Through their words and their actions, the self-righteous one puts their righteousness over you. They put their self-righteousness over the Lord as well. And God is righteous. God is perfect. The religious leaders of Jesus's day, they are proof of this as they were so self-righteous in their way that their righteousness, it blinded them. It blinded them to the righteousness of the Lord that stood before them. Are you blind today in your self-righteousness? Are you blind to what's going on around you? Are you blind to those that are around you? Are you blind to the truth in the Lord? 
In the blindness of the religious leaders of Jesus day, the religious leaders, they, they became bitter in their hearts when true righteousness took a stand before them. And I'm talking about the true righteousness that was in Jesus. They were bitter in their hearts to Jesus. Again, let us remember what James said about that bitterness being in the heart of one who is supposed to be of faith. Bitterness that it lies in the hearts of man or in someone, it cannot produce righteousness. It can't produce any good. In other words, the self-righteous can't produce any good. So James, he encouraged us to be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to rav, because this produces the righteousness of God. Listen to those words there that James said in, the, in his first chapter in the 19th verse. James encouraged us to be swift to hear, not swift to speak, but swift to hear. Slow to speak, slow to wrath, because this produces good. It produces the righteousness of God. Maybe those that are self-righteous in our society today, maybe they should stop for a moment. Maybe they should, in other words, shut up for a moment and listen. Shut up for a moment and listen. And maybe some good can come from that being quiet for a moment and listening to what others have to say. Because again, you don't know everything. You ain't perfect. No matter what you may think. We must allow ourselves to be guided by the words of God, by the pure words of the Lord today. Elihu, we should note, he ticked off every box on that checklist. Mm -hmm. Elihu was swift to hear. He was slow to speak and he was slow to wrath. Mm -hmm. That is what the genuine believer ought to be today. The one who claims to be a child of God. Mm -hmm. That's how we ought to be when dealing with two self-righteous parties. Being guided by the pure words of God, the believer should offer a rebuke to the self-righteous that does not come from a place of piety, that does not come from a place of bitterness, that does not come from a place of wrath, but comes from a place of humility. That is what I ask of us as, a, as children of the Lord today, that when we offer rebuke, when we offer correction, that we do it from a place of humility. Will you have that humility in the world today, in our society and among each other today? Will you have that humility when you choose, when you decide to take a stand? To get through to Job, Yes, Elihu, we were told in scripture, was frustrated there. But Elihu, he moved out of that frustration in truth and in humility. That's what separated him from Job's friends and even from Job himself. Elihu, we will see, posed a question to Job there in my key verse for today. Elihu, he asked this blameless and this upright man in Job, he asked, do you think that this is right? Do you say my righteousness is more than God's? Do you think it is right for you to say that your righteousness is more than God's? Again, I tell you that this was a very pointed question that came from Elihu to Job, the man who was blameless and who was upright in God's eyes. This, I believe, it is a pointed question for all people in the world today. Both those who believe and those who do not believe, especially all of those who are caught up in the shackles of their self-righteousness. You see, Job, he believed that he was too righteous to suffer and to go through what it was that he was going through. He believed that because he was righteous, that he ought not have any kind of struggle. 
by his accusations, Job even believed he could tell God what is just and what is unjust. I believe there are many self-righteous people that do that today. They, they, they believe that they can tell God what is right and what is wrong. Who are we to question the Lord or to tell him what is just and what is unjust? Who, who are we to tell the Lord what is right and what is wrong? What in the world are we thinking? What in the world are the self-righteous thinking to do that? Who are we to tell God what to do and what not to do? When to move and when not to move? Again, what in the world are we thinking? To tell our maker and our creator when to move and when not to move. We hung up in our self-righteousness if we're doing that. Something has gone terribly, terribly wrong. If you are doing that, check yourself is what I would say. You see, we happen, we happen to do this every time we go, go and get out ahead of God and start taking things into our own hands by, by moving ourselves, by then judging and, and condemning others when it's not our place to actually do that. We do this ourselves when we decide to, to dictate to others what they should do and, and what they ought not to do as if we are God himself. What in the world are we thinking today? God has not commanded us to do this. He's not commanded us to, to go out and judge and to condemn someone as Job's friends was doing to him. They believed that Job had done wrong. And they, they believed, they knew it in their hearts that he had done wrong. And they judged him. They condemned him. And then they dictated to him what he ought to do in their piety and in their self-righteousness. And again, I tell you, there are many people in our world today that is doing just that to both you and me and to all those who are around us. What in the world are they thinking today? What is going on today? God has commanded us to help and to love one another, right. not to condemn, not to dictate, not to oppress each other, not to bring harm to each other. I don't know if you hear me here today. Amen. I tell you, the self-righteous, they frustrate me. They anger me. Think about this. If we have the audacity to think that we can tell God what to do, what stops us from thinking that we can tell others and dictate to others what they should and should not do? That's where we are in our society today. This is what we deal with when it comes to the self-righteous heart today. It's time to take a stand. Elihu, he took a stand against the self-righteous. Elihu, he would go on to ask Job about what he could possibly do for the Lord there in the 35th chapter in the 6th and the 7th verse. And these questions, I tell you, they, they point out a serious truth to not only Job, but to all of us today as well. That truth being that we are not God. Amen. None of us are him. We are not righteous by anything that we do ourselves. We are not righteous by our own might. And it's time for us to stop thinking that way. Therefore, because we are not righteous by our own might, we do not have some greater understanding than somebody else. Nor do we have the authority to look on others and then dictate to them what is right and what is wrong by our own self-righteousness. The only one who can do such a thing is the Lord who rules over all things. And yet even God leaves us with a choice to either obey him or not. God gives us, he gives you, he gives me a choice. 
With that in mind, what you and I can do is take a stand in the righteousness of the Lord. We do this by living according to the pure way, the pure words of the Lord. And we then share these pure words in a manner that gives others the choice to either live by them or not, not dictating, not it judging and not condemning them, giving them the ability, the same ability that God has given to us to choose. The writer of Hebrews encouraged us to pursue peace there in the 12th chapter of Hebrews. The writer tells us, encourages us to pursue peace and holiness, not with some people, but with all people. In doing this, there in the 15th verse of the 12th chapter of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews said to us that we should look carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble and by this many become defiled. Mm -hmm. Elihu took a stand because he saw bitterness Mm -hmm. coming out of Job Mm -hmm. and he needed to put a stop to the righteous man becoming a bitter man in his heart. Mm -hmm. Job being a pillar in his community He would have a great influence on all of those who are around him through his words and also through his actions as well. In Elihu, he he pointed this out to Job when he said that in the 35th chapter of Job and in the 8th verse, your wickedness affects a man such as you. Then he also pointed out your righteousness, it affects a son of a man. We influence all of those who are around us by our words and and by our actions, especially the one who is a child of God. As you have heard me say before to you a bunch of times, you are always being watched Mm -hmm. as a child of God. Mm -hmm. Somebody is going to follow in your example. It is best for us to set an example of one that is taking a stand in true righteousness instead of self-righteousness. I don't know if you hear me here today. In essence, Elihu wanted Job to understand that he would set an example to follow and also influence others to do just as he does. Should others follow in his lead of wickedness, Elihu pointed out that only pain and suffering would await them there in the ninth verse. I look around at the examples being set today in our society that pour out from the self-righteous ones. Examples of anger, examples of hatred of others. And again, I tell you, it's quite saddening to see that this is the example that is being set for the younger generations. It is saddening because generation after generation only knows how to hurt one another rather than love and help uplift each other due to the stance of the self-righteous ones. The self-righteous ones, they always seem to be the one who speaks the loudest. It's time for us to take a stand and speak just as loudly as they do but it's time for us to do that from a place of true righteousness. Mm-hmm. All we have been left with is pain and suffering in our world today due to this, due to this push of, of self-righteousness and generation after generation only knows that pain and that suffering. And it seems that things aren't getting any better though we like to dream and though we like to imagine that the future generations mm-hmm. will get it right. How can they ever get it right when self-righteousness is the only example that is being set by the generations that stand and come before them? How do they have a chance to ever get it right? How can things get any better if we continue to allow self-righteousness to have its way? To stand against self-righteousness, I tell you today that it must be made. The stance of one who takes a stand in the righteousness of the Lord is one that will open hearts rather than shut them off. 
As Solomon said in the book of Proverbs, the mouth of the righteous is a well of life, but violence covers the mouth of the wicked. Hatred stirs up strife, Solomon said, but love covers all sin. So if we are honest with ourselves today, a lot of the mess that we see being kicked up in our society today is being led by people who claim to be a child of God. I would suggest to you today that the stance against self-righteousness, it must first begin within us ourselves and then those who are closest to us as well. We must ensure that we and those who are closest to us are not moving out of self-righteousness. As soon as we see it start to creep up, we ought to be like Elihu and we ought to shut it down. Mm -hmm. You see, a terrible truth that we must face today is that many of us, we can be just like Job at times. Mm -hmm. We can get hung up in our own self-righteousness and we can begin to speak from that self-righteousness. Mm -hmm. But hopefully in such days, we have an Elihu that will shut us down, that will tell us when to shut up, that will tell us when to go and sit down and when to think about what we're about to do and what we're about to say. That will tell us, hey, it's time for you to go to God in whatever it is that you are dealing with so that you can get back on the right track. I don't know if you hear me here today. Another terrible truth that we must face today when it comes to self-righteousness is that the self-righteous actions that some take in our world today, it shows a lack of trust in the Lord. Mm -hmm. I would ask the self-righteous one today, do you not trust in the Lord? Do you not trust in how the Lord is moving to the point that you feel that you need to get out ahead of him? And that you need to move for God. How can you move for God? How can you say that you think and know what God is going to do? Do you trust in, do you not trust in how the Lord is moving to the point that you believe that you know what is best for yourself and that you know what is best for all of those that are around you? It certainly feels like many people, especially those claiming to love and to trust in the Lord, it certainly feels like that's the manner in which they, they move. They move as if they do not truly trust the Lord. So they've moved like they got to do things by their own accord rather than allow the Lord to have his perfect work. Yeah. You see, we truly must become more trusting of the Lord today. Trust that all things are in his control. Mm -hmm. Trust that his will will be done. And for in order for us to truly trust the Lord, we must again first humble ourselves. And then we must be obedient. There that word is again. Mm -hmm. We must be obedient to his word. Mm -hmm. This was the lesson that Job needed to learn in his day of grief, in his day of sorrow and in his day of self-righteousness. Now, of course, in the end, when Job learned this lesson from the God, from God personally, Job, he ended up being greatly blessed and he received more than what he once had. I believe today that all of us, should we humble ourselves and should we let go of our self-righteousness and should we become more obedient to the perfect and pure words of the Lord, I believe that not only will we be truly blessed and wonderfully blessed, but I believe that those, I believe that our society as well can become more wonderfully blessed as well. Anger and hatred will begin to cease, I believe, if we live by the pure and perfect words of the Lord. And I believe that more love and peace can actually enter into the picture if we remove ourselves from self-righteousness and live by the true righteousness of God. Doing otherwise will lead to no progress and we will remain stuck in the mud 
hurting and suffering. So I tell you today that we need to take a stand and that we need to let go of self-righteousness. And when we do so, we will finally be able to treat each other better. Amen. 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 Amen.